The wall of water which devastated Boss Castle. Tonight, ten years on, we're back in the village to see how it's recovered. Good evening. On the eve of the 10th anniversary of the disaster, we'll hear from some of those who were caught up in it. So we escaped, every one of us, up to the, up to the ladder, into the garden up above, and we were safe. Also tonight, the catch caught on camera. CCTV on board fishing boats to monitor how much is being thrown back into the sea. And standing on her own two feet again, the paralysed rider who's battling back by becoming a bionic woman. Ten years ago this weekend, an intense and localised storm wrought havoc on one small corner of North Cornwall. The villages of Boscastle and Crackington Haven were the worst hit. Problems started in the afternoon on the 16th of August 2004. Heavy rain started falling on the moors above Boscastle. By one o'clock, river levels in the village were starting to rise. By 3.30, the River Valencia had burst its banks. At 3.45, the fire service started receiving calls for help. At around four o'clock, families who were trapped in the visitor centre had to climb into the attic to escape the rising water. Cars were starting to float through the village. At 4.45, the first of seven helicopters arrived on the scene. And just after five, a major incident was declared. Johnny Rutherford reports now on the scenes of devastation which greeted the rescuers. A month's rainfall in two hours. A Cornish village under siege from a freak rainstorm ten years ago. A major incident declared in North Cornwall. Dozens of people trapped after flash flooding in Boscastle. There was this huge bang and uh, all of a sudden the river started flooding and that, it, just, it was literally in a, in a matter of seconds. And within about ten minutes there was cars that were just floating down, downstream into the, into the sea. Jude Rees was on holiday at the time. The sudden storm and its skill even took the Met Office by surprise. Absolute shock to see this, and it's just one thunderstorm that's caused all the problems. The Coast Guard was one of the first to be alerted. Yeah, we've got an incident starting at Boscastle. The river has burst its banks. The river has burst its banks. And it's really torrents flowing down the stream, down the street here. A lot of people around. That call started the biggest peacetime rescue in mainland Britain. Now the Coast Guard wants uh, all uh, available aerial assets to come to this incident. As well as the main emergency services, seven helicopters were scrambled and battled against strong winds and torrential rain. That is a major incident, I have to say. They flew for hours over the devastated village, flying very low, avoiding trees and, of course, each other, as they went from building to building, plucking off stranded villagers and holidaymakers. There was a, a real mixture of relief. You could see that in a lot of people. Just they, they instantly thought, right, I'm now safe. Other people were still scared, um, and some were even jovial. They, they, they couldn't believe what was happening. And there, there was a bit of hysterics coming out in them. You know, we've got two on the end of that building, don't you? Over 120 people were rescued in seven hours. At its peak, the flooding ripped through the village with a wall of water 10 feet high, travelling up to 40 miles per hour. I've been working today in it was the Harbour Light, which has now disappeared. It's one of the oldest buildings in Boscastle, 400 years old. I turned around and a car, I saw a car hit it and it, yeah, it went. We could see buildings crumbling around us, the Harbour Light across the other side of the harbour. Uh, as the water was gushing through it, all of a sudden it, uh, it just crumbled like a pack of cards. And uh, water was pouring through the youth hostel uh, out of the windows and uh, you just wonder what was going to happen next. Do we know these cars are empty? Only six casualties were taken to hospital, mostly suffering from shock and the effects of the cold. It's incredible to think that no one was badly injured or dragged out to sea by the sudden raging flood that caused so much devastation. Johnny Rutherford, BBC Spotlight. Well, ten years on from the devastating floods, Boss Castle has rebuilt and a new flood defence have been put in place to protect the village. Well, we can cross now live to the village and Simon Clemerson is there for us tonight. Simon. 
Very good evening to you, Rebecca. Yes, students actually come down here now to study those flood defences you mentioned. We've seen them today. The whole village has been packed. It's back to its former glory. There's always a danger when a place suffers a devastating event that it becomes defined by it. And if you look back at press cuttings of floods since, they do talk about, is it another boss castle? It becomes a benchmark, but not necessarily in a bad way. Now, the pain has gone here. Uh, the character and the appeal does seem to be boosted by what's happened. More on that and on the flood defences in a moment. But first, Eleanor Parkinson has been to meet some people who were here that terrible day 10 years ago. Trixie Webster lives in a flat above her place of work. When the water began pouring in through her upstairs windows, she knew it was time to go. Someone put down a ladder here and we escaped, every one of us, up to the... Up the ladder into the garden up above and we were safe. So you had to scramble up this wall? Yes, yes. And, and everyone was doing the same sort of thing? Oh yes. Going up? Yeah, that's what we had to do. But Boss Castle wasn't the only place to be hit. Seven miles down the coast here at Crackerton Haven they were also left submerged under a wall of water. Restaurants were flooded out, people were trapped in buildings and cars washed out to sea. Staff at the Cabin Cafe overlooking the Cove and car park realised very quickly the situation was serious and escaped to higher ground just in time. Just a lot of water at a short time, and because when the bank up there went, then, then it was obvious that things were going to happen. Everybody was all right, because, you know, everybody had time to escape, so I weren't worried. It was just a matter of watching, and with disbelief, cars coming to the bridge and having a hiccup and then just being thrown over the top. Back in Boscastle, and Tracy Bright found herself cut off from her husband. She was eight months pregnant and had a midwife's appointment in a neighbouring town. It wasn't until I came out of the midwife's appointment they said, oh, you won't be able to get back. So I tried to get back, couldn't get back, and I went back to Mum's in Camelford, where I sort of watched it on the television, but eight and a half months pregnant, I was getting a bit panicky. Plus all the phones were down, so we couldn't get hold of anybody. So all I knew was that Boscas was flooded and he was missing. But the couple were soon reunited and Lily was born just 10 days later, the first child to be born in the village after a remarkable day which changed many lives. Eleanor Parkinson, BBC Spotlight, Boscastle. And research by the Met Office suggests there could be a significant increase in the number of extreme summer downpours in the future. Global warming boosting the moisture in the air. Ten years ago tonight, the conditions here weren't that remarkable. Any sharp showers were expected to pass over rapidly. But then the landscape and the atmosphere clashed, as I've been finding out from the Environment Agency down there. Andrew, we know from secondary school geography that if there's a lot of rain, it's got to get out to the sea and so it's going to come down through the valley. What, what was so unusual? Well, it was. There was a very special set of circumstances on the 16th of August 10 years ago where the two air masses met on the high ground above Boss Castle on stuck. the moorland. And, it, and they, yeah, exactly, they stalled and they stayed there and it kept raining really intensely for, for four or five hours. <laughs> and this here is the solution, is it? Yes, this is the bottom end of the, of the River Jordan flood defence scheme, which we built within six months of the flood occurring. Uh, it's a bypass culvert that comes down the road and it, it helps relieve the flood risk to, that we saw that was so awful that affected the Wellington Hotel and Marine Terrace. And what else have you been doing? Well, where we're stood now, this is, this is the River Valencia. What we did was we widened and deepened the, the River Valencia and set the car park, car park, which is upstream of here, back from the river. Where all those came from that ended up in the harbour? Quite set that back from the from the river to make more space for water really but to someone who's not been here before andy you can't tell anything's happened doesn't look like you've got a flood defense scheme does it well, well exactly and that was one of the things we one of our key aims really with the scheme it we we knew how important the historic environment of boss castle was we wanted to reduce the flood risk with the community but we wanted to keep that historic environment intact, and I, th I think we've achieved that balance. It's not some big concrete flume as you could have had, maybe. <laughs> Quite. You spent £10 million sorting out Boss Castle. What about all the other villages on the North Cornwall coast, or in Devon, or in Somerset, or Dorset? The £10 million was, was the wider regeneration, and it also covered all the other locations that were affected in North Cornwall as well. Um, the, 
we, we've got a program of flood risk improvements across the region, across the country, and we've also learned a lot from this 2004 flood. We've identified similar rapidly responding catchments like Boss Castle, and we've engaged with the communities to help them manage their flood risk and make their communities more resilient. Andy Houghton. Well, this is just one of the businesses which has had to be completely rebuilt. I'm joined now by Ian Kemp from the National Trust, which owns a lot of the land here. You were here that day as well, weren't you? I was, yes. What was it like? Uh, it was one of those unforgettable experiences, as, as so many people have reflected the, this week on the 10th anniversary. It's something you never forget. I think the strongest memories for me were just the sheer force of the water, the damage that it, it unleashed in such a short time, and then the human impact. At the end of the day, so many people whose lives have been deeply affected by it, livelihoods gone, homes damaged. No. And 10 years on, it does seem, as I was saying at the top, to have added to the, the character, to the story of the place, to the appeal. You're, you're seeing that, aren't you? Well, it was probably the biggest single event in Boscastle's history, but I, I don't think the village would want to be defined by that, but undoubtedly, you're right. It's, it attracted huge numbers of uh, vast interest and huge numbers of people in the years afterwards, and they still come. And, and it's, it's part of the history, it's part of what people want to find, about, find out about when they come here now. Ian, thank you very much indeed. Well, how, when and where rain falls, the science of it and what to do uh, when it does is still very challenging, but measures are improving all the time. And the forecast you'll be pleased to hear on the 10th anniversary for Boscastle is settled. Simon in Boscastle, thank you. And this weekend also marks 62 years since the devastating Lynmouth floods in which 34 people died. On the 15th and 16th of August 1952, nine inches of rain fell on Exmoor. The water flowed off the moors and into the rivers, which then formed a torrent that cascaded through Lynmouth overnight. More than 100 buildings were destroyed, along with 28 of the 31 bridges. Almost 40 cars were washed out to sea. 420 people were made homeless. Coming up next, further revelations about a controversy which has rocked Plymouth University. Also still ahead in Friday Spotlight, we'll catch up with the Devon hockey player who helped England win silver at the Commonwealth Games. And food, glorious food, as Flavour Fest welcomes thousands of visitors to Plymouth. A senior figure at Plymouth University is claiming she's been forced out of her role as part of the ongoing dispute at the top of the organisation. In a statement today, Barbara Bond criticises the university's board of governors for the way they're running the university and for their decision to effectively suspend the vice-chancellor, Wendy Purcell, last month. The university denies dismissing Mrs Bond. Well, our correspondent, Neil Gallagher, is following the story and is with me now. Let's start with, with Mrs Bond. Who is she? Well, she's held a number of senior positions at the university. She's a former chairman of governors. And recently she's had this ambassadorial role, which is really what a pro-chancellor is. She's also an MBE. Now, her role as pro-chancellor came to an end last month, but she says that she had been asked by Wendy Purcell as chief exec to uh, do another term. Now, the university is saying today that her role simply came to its natural end. She says it was brought to an end. And Barbara Bond has been criticising the board of governors for their handling of the Wendy Purcell affair. Essentially, yes. At, at the heart of this is a, a quite bitter dispute, it would seem, between the chief executive or vice-chancellor, Wendy Purcell, and the chairman of her board of governors, Judge William Taylor, retired judge. Now, uh, Wendy Purcell was placed on leave by the board of governors last month. We don't yet know why. Today, Barbara Bond is calling on the board to reinstate Wendy Purcell before, as she puts it, they do any more damage to the university. Mrs Bond says that she has long-standing concerns about what she calls questionable governance practice at the university and she also claims that the board lacks the experience to deal with the, uh, the ambitions and development of the university under Wendy Purcell's leadership. And I gather Mrs Bond has been in dialogue with the university's regulators. Uh, yes, Barbara Bond says she went to see the regulator Hefke with her concerns and she has in fact served on Hefke's leadership advisory committee so she plays quite a key role in this saga. And what's the university said today? Well, the universities say they strongly refute any suggestion that the governance of the university is in crisis. They point out that Hefke visited the university in June and found insufficient evidence to investigate Barbara Bond's complaints for themselves. Now, we do know that um, Hefke did recommend the university to have an external review of governance, which is still to be carried out. But the university are pointing out that Hefke have confirmed that this case against Wendy Purcell is quite properly something for the university itself to investigate. Now, that case is still going on, no sign of it concluding. We watch this space. OK, Neil, thank you very much indeed. 
Southwest fishermen are about to begin further trials using CCTV to cut down on the amount of fish being thrown back into the sea. They've told Spotlight they're keen to reduce the overall amount of discards, but believe some species, such as young monkfish, can have good survival rates if they're returned to the sea. Our environment correspondent Adrian Campbell has more. A small number of Southwest vessels have been fitted with CCTV and they're being closely monitored to ensure they bring back everything they catch. It's part of trials using different net sizes which have helped to dramatically cut the amount of fish which is thrown back into the sea. We're trying to ensure that certain species aren't discarded, for example, sole, Dover sole, um, and we review the footage from these cameras to ensure sole isn't discarded. These young monkfish were filmed by a fisherman after being landed on a southwest fishing boat. Many fishermen believe it makes sense to throw them back into the sea. Juvenile monkfish in particular are susceptible to being caught in trawls. One of the things that we've been keen to do is highlight what we believe is a high survival rate of juvenile monkfish such that they can be returned to sea in the future to go on and return and grow into adult fish. New European regulations to reduce the amount of fish put back into the sea start to take effect from next year. There's uncertainty about how these new rules will be enforced, but fishermen say they're worried they'll be expected to bring back every single fish they catch, including those of no value. We were having to keep boxes and boxes of undersized plaice, which would have been returned to the sea and, and hopefully have grown to um, a commercial size. Fishermen say they're working with scientists to show that returning some fish to sea can help conservation. Adrian Campbell, BBC Spotlight. On to this evening's sport now, and Dave Gibbons has been to Kingsbridge in South Devon to welcome home a Commonwealth Games silver medalist who helped England reach the hockey finals in Glasgow. Well, here in Kingsbridge, it's a homecoming for the Commonwealth Games silver medalist Giselle Ansley, back in her hometown after winning the silver medal which she adorns there for the England women's hockey team. More with Giselle in a moment. But first, with only two weeks into the new football season, Plymouth Argyle are preparing for a five-figure crowd and a big police presence for the Devon confrontation against nearest rivals Exeter City at Home Park tomorrow. It's the first time they've met so early in a season. Last time round, City did the double over Argyle and have just had their transfer embargo lifted. The Pilgrims were unlucky to bow out of the League Cup on Tuesday night after Reuben Reed's two goals against Leighton Orient. Well, Exeter Harriers runner Joe Pavey is very confident of winning another gold at the European Athletics Championships in Zurich tomorrow. Four days after her 10,000 metre success, the 40-year-old mum tries to add the 5,000 metres title. Joe starts her bid at 4.40 in the afternoon. There's coverage on BBC Two. Well, to my main guest here this evening in Kingsbridge. She's back in her hometown. It's Giselle Ansley, who's proudly wearing the silver medal around her neck that she won for the England hockey team in the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow. Alas, you were 11 seconds away from winning the gold against your main rivals, Australia, in the gold medal match. They equalised and went on to win the penalty shootout. Um, how long did it take you and your teammates to recover from that agony? Yeah, um quite a long time to be honest but you know we've come to come to terms with it and we're you know now really very proud of our, our, our silver medal. What sort of feedback and acknowledgement have you received from people in the town? Um, you know a lot of support from friends and family throughout the whole tournament when when I was up there and you know old school teachers and stuff like that from from Kingsbridge and uh, from my previous school as well so it's been you know the support's been tremendous it's been really really good obviously got Olympic qualifiers which is the the main focus for all of us but also we've got the European Championships next year. Giselle I hope it's a, a very successful year ahead I'm sure it will be thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you. There we are so that's it from me here at Kingsbridge hope you have a lovely weekend and in Enjoy your sport from Giselle and me, back to you. Dave Gibbons there. Now, a 25-year-old woman from Cornwall paralysed in a riding accident two years ago is learning to stand up using a bionic leg. Susanna Hext broke her back and pelvis and was left in a wheelchair after a horse fell on her. She's recently started riding again and is determined to walk without crutches. Well, Spotlight's Janine Jansen has been to see her at the country's leading rehabilitation centre for injured jockeys in Berkshire. Two years ago, Susanna Hext was paralysed when a horse fell on her. After eight operations and a year and a half in a wheelchair, she can now walk with crutches 
thanks to an electrical battery pack in her spine. But she has no feeling in her left foot and ankle. Last month she achieved her goal, to ride again. But there's a problem, it keeps going into spasm. Oh God. <laughs> so she's come to Oaksey House in Berkshire, where they help injured jockeys. The people here just seem to think that nothing's impossible, so it's a great attitude. <laughs> and now, the exciting part. So this is the um, bionic leg, and basically it's an assisted robotic walking device which is controlled by Susie. Um, and what happens basically is we have a sensor that Susie puts in her shoe. It feels quite weird, especially when it turns on and it's quite noisy, it makes quite funny noises. Yeah. yeah. Right, OK. Can you pop this on your leg for me? Susanna is determined to stand up on both legs. I will stand on it, even if it doesn't like it. <laughs> However long it takes. <laughs> OK. Mm -hmm. Tell me if you need to stop. You're in control. Bring weight forward, straighten your other leg. Well done. Good, yeah, nice, really nice. Yeah. Well done, good. Bring yourself forward, yes. Beautiful. Ah. You've got it. OK. <laughs> Breathe. Ah. <laughs> well done. It's the first time she stood up in two years. Yeah. <laughs> Determined, are you? Very. <laughs> I'm not going to let my leg beat me. So, um, yeah, I will, uh, I will beat my leg. And uh, however long it takes, I will get there. Her passion for riding is so strong, nothing will get in her way. Janine Jansen, BBC Spotlight, Oaksey House. She's such a positive, upbeat person, isn't she? Extraordinary. Now, lentil burgers, blueberry beer and curried goat. No, that's not Rebecca's tea, but just <laughs> some of be. the... It might be. <laughs> could well be. It's just some of the offerings at Plymouth's three-day Flavour Fest, which is celebrating its 11th anniversary this year. Yes, it's a chance to showcase the best of our regional produce alongside demonstrations from some of the top names in gastronomy. John Henderson had the difficult job of going along and sauntering through the food stalls. <laughs> Plymouth's Flavour Fest is back and it's bigger than ever. I can reach over and uh, surreptitiously help myself to all the best goodies and uh, occasionally carry a long drinking straw as well, so uh, all quite useful, really. Cheers! Cheesy? How about some Cornish Gouda with fenugreek? It looks great and it's really unusual. People haven't ever seen anything like it before. There are 120 stands at the three-day event as well as some highly entertaining produce. <laughs> in the cookery theatre, some top quality chefs. Uh, it's stuck. <laughs> and then there's BBC Radio Devon's David Fitzgerald and Bill Buckley attempting Ready Steady Cook, overseen by Natalie. <laughs> Bill won the first round, but Fitz pulled it back with an omelette. If, if we're talking about, you know, a family omelette that a small child would like, fine. If we're talking about a classic omelette cooked in the French style, then, then mine was clearly the winner. And I'm afraid Plymouth didn't reflect that today in its judgment, but never mind. Mine was cooked more in the Devonian style, i.e. it was well travelled across, um, across the pan, across the, across the cooking surface, and then onto the floor. That was fine. I mean, to, you know, roughage, that's what I was going for, roughage. <laughs> Curry goat proved a hit at lunch. An abundance of exotic flavours from the Caribbean. Yeah. Thank you very much. And how about washing it down with a blueberry bevy? So eat, drink and be merry. Down in one, Zulu Warrior. Yeah, you know it, it's good. John Henderson, BBC Spotlight, Plymouth. And he didn't bring us back any samples, no, did I'm he? I'm very hungry now. Naughty John Henderson. Lovely. Well, time now for the weather. And, David, much different weather in Boscastle today of that of ten years ago. Yeah, I just thought I'd summarise very quickly what happened ten years ago because it's very difficult to uh, remember that far back for most of us. Good evening to you. The rainfall amounts are the ones that really shout out and the rainfall that fell just up, up the hill from Boscastle was at Otterham in a four-hour space of time, 200 millimetres of rain. What that equated to passing through Boscastle on the day was two million tonnes of water. And that's the reason for all the damage. Now, hopefully this weekend we'll have nothing like this. It is a reasonable weekend to look forward to, a bright start. Uh, clouding over somewhat, though, and there is the risk of some patchy rain, especially on Sunday morning. But that rain band shouldn't pull away, and we'll get some sunshine once that goes through. 
We're looking to the north for our weather. This stripe of cloud way up to the north is a weather system that's coming into Scotland first. It's a thin line of cloud, but it does introduce quite a change for us. Colder air behind it. It's a cold weather system. Moves down across Scotland and Northern Ireland. This is the middle of the day tomorrow. But by the time we're getting up on Sunday morning, it will be across us. And it's going to produce a few spits of light rain or drizzle. Moving through fairly steadily. And what follows on behind, as you can see, is a northerly wind. It's a cold wind, so we are going to see a drop in the temperatures. Both nighttime and daytime temperatures will be below average for the time of year. Not bad this evening, a fine evening for most of us. There's just patchy cloud floating around, a few showers drifting into parts of Somerset. They'll fade away overnight tonight. And it is largely clear, which means it'll turn chilly. Now, overnight temperatures for most of us, 11 or 12 degrees. But I think inland, uh, in the countryside, well away from the coast, particularly up over the moors, we might get 9 or 10 overnight tonight. So quite a cold start. Tomorrow is sort of bright and dry, at least to start with, with some morning sunshine, albeit rather hazy. But very quickly the cloud will come in, and through the afternoon that cloud will start to produce a few showers. So a cloudy end to the day, also becoming quite breezy, especially along the south coast of Cornwall and around the Isles of Scilly, as those winds become more westerly. Temperatures. Well, right on the coast, 16, 17 degrees, where we hold on to the brightness for longest. That's the east of Devon into Somerset and Dorset, 19, the highest temperature. That's the forecast for the hours of Scilly, mostly dry, but clouding over with showers through the afternoon. Also, as I mentioned, becoming quite breezy here. Quick look at the times of high water at Penzance, that's at 9.22, Plymouth, 10.37, and Biddeford, 10.36. And for our surfers, like we've seen all week really, the north coast has choppy surf because of the onshore wind. Three, maybe four feet here. The south coast clean, but the waves will be smaller. There's the forecast for the coastal waters. The winds are from the northwest, four or five. Backing westerly, five, increasing six overnight. Showers with generally good visibility. Now the winds are coming in from the north or the northwest as we head into Sunday, but quite a breeze will blow, particularly as we move towards the end of the day, those northwest winds introducing colder air too. So the temperatures are dropping by the time we get to Tuesday of next week, down to just 16 degrees, 61 in Fahrenheit. Have a nice weekend. Back to you. Thanks, David. Well, that's all from us for tonight. It doesn't seem like a decade ago to me, but we'll leave you with the dramatic images of the flooding which swept through Boss Castle and Crackington Haven ten years ago this weekend. Good night. Bye-bye. Give us whiskey, whiskey, what's up to That is a major incident.